The Orville Season 2 has a flirtatious opening as crew members have to find a companion before attending Boris' Jaloja party. You see, Mocklins urinate only once a year and they hold a ceremony at a spot they choose on Mocklis, with friends and family in attendance. Going to someone's Jaloja party without a mate brings bad luck so we see some officers going on dates. Grayson doesn't need to search for a date because she has been seeing the ship's teacher Cassius for about a month and finding out about her new relationship is not easy for Mercer as he still thinks he and Grayson can make it work. Throughout the episode, Mercer tells Grayson he loves her multiple times, but Grayson reminds him that they've gone over this. She doesn't think it's possible for a first officer and a captain to be in a romantic relationship. Mercer even spies on Grayson from the outside of the Orville to learn who she is dating. At first he doesn't know it's Cassius, and because of this Grayson has to take Cassius to the simulation room where they can't be watched. When they get there, however, they catch a bunch of kids drinking alcohol, and one of these kids is Dr. Finn's son Marcus. He's been hanging out with a mischievous kid by the name of James Duncan, and James is the one who's responsible for the group's shenanigans. James's parents don't see it that way though, instead they blame Marcus for corrupting James, that is until Isaac exposes their son. Isaac shows everybody that James not only hacked the food synthesizer for alcohol, but he also changed his grades. Isaac's help means a lot to Finn, so she invites him to the Jaloja party. Coming back to Grayson, she's not happy about what Mercer has done and she lets him know. She's also angry with Cassius because of his quote-unquote high road attitude, because Cassius understands why Mercer is jealous and he's not that bothered, which angers Grayson even more. Mercer apologizes to Cassius for spying on him and Grayson, and Mercer even gives Cassius some tips on how to win Grayson over, which works, so Cassius and Grayson are on good terms by the time Boris's Jaloja takes place. Alara, on the other hand, doesn't have much luck when it comes to finding the right man. Boris tries to fix her up with Dan, but he's a little too weird for Alara's liking. And in the meantime, Malloy chickens out of asking out Lieutenant Janelle Tyler, the ship's new dark space cartographer, and she ends up having a drink with Mercer at the end of the episode. The second episode of the season is a lesson in software security, as Boris' adult content addiction leads to a virus infecting the Orville. Boris is using the simulator to cheat on Clyden, and that's how the virus gets into the ship. Clyden almost kills Boris because that's how you divorce someone in Mockless, but Dr. Finn saves Boris. Boris doesn't want Clyden to face charges, which is why they have to go through marriage counseling. And there it comes out that Boris was cheating on Clyden because he resents the fact that Clyden changed the gender of their children despite Boris' objection. The timing of this computer virus couldn't have been worse as the crew is in the middle of a rescue mission to bail out survivors from Nixia, a planet that's about to be consumed by a red star. Radiation doesn't affect Isaac and Boris, so they're the ones carrying out the evacuation mission. Their shuttle can only take 30 of the 75 survivors, and they save those people after picking them out by lottery. But the virus takes control of the Orville and they're headed to the Red Star. Luckily, as always, Isaac comes up with a way to defeat the virus and saves the day. Having seen families getting separated on Nixia and all the loss of life on that planet, Bordas decides to apologize to Clyden and says that he's grateful to have them as his family. Clyden responds in kind and the Mocklin family is reunited. Alara's body is getting used to Earth's level of gravity after being away from her high-gravity home planet Selea for so long. Because of this, Isaac breaks her arm when they arm wrestle. Alara is not strong enough, so Finn thinks it'd be a good idea to send her to Selea for a while. There, Alara isn't even able to stand up and she has to use a floating chair to move around. On top of her physical problems, Alara has to deal with psychological problems as well because her family don't hide the fact that they don't approve of her career choices. They wanted Alara to have a more academic education like her sister, and this sort of treatment is what drove Alara away from her family in the first place. Alara's father, Ildis, takes the family to their vacation home to defuse this tense situation, but a neighbor couple seeking revenge on the Kitan family makes things worse. 
The couple blames Ildis for their son's suicide because they believe Ildis stopped their son's academic progress, and it is Alara who eventually saves the day after regaining her strength, protecting not only her family but also Mercer who just came there to deliver some good news about Dr. Finn's treatment that would restore and maintain Alara's Selene strength. Ildis and Alara share an emotional moment as Ildis finally realizes that Alara has her own unique qualities and she doesn't have to be like everybody else in Selea, simply chasing scientific success like everyone else. And Alara reveals she's always wanted to be seen by her parents for what she is and to be loved for what she is and now she's finally got that. Which is why she decides to leave the Orville and experience life with a loving family for the first time in her life, something she didn't even think Think was a possibility for her. So this new opportunity is why she stays in Selea. Just when Mercer allows himself to relax and he takes a vacation with her new girlfriend Tyler, they're both captured by the Krill, who torture Tyler in order to get Mercer to spill the beans. He does so, giving the Krill his union command codes, after which he learns that Tyler is actually Talaya, the teacher whose ship Mercer and Malloy infiltrated in season 1. Mercer spared Talaya and her students, but he had to kill all the other Krill to stop them from wrecking a Union planet. This undercover mission was Talaya's revenge plot. Mercer catches a break when the Krill ship is attacked by their enemies, the Choctaw, and he manages to knock out a guard and pick up his weapon. Mercer makes his way to an escape pod with Talaya. He's in control at first, but he's knocked out when the escape pod lands on a planet, putting Talaya in charge because she has the gun. That doesn't last very long because she's getting weakened by the sunlight, that's the Krill's weakness, and she orders Mercer to send the distress signal, and Mercer uses this opportunity to contact the Orville on a Krill frequency. Talaya is understandably not too happy when she sees the Orville, instead of a Krill ship, so she's ready to kill Mercer but the Choctaw show up once again, and she has to give her gun to Mercer so that he can fight them off. She is in no condition to kill the Choctaw on her own, and killing Mercer would lead to her own death. After defeating the Choctaw, they get back to the Orville, and interestingly, Mercer decides to let Talaya go as a gesture of goodwill, hoping that this will eventually lead to diplomatic relations between the Krill and the Union. Somebody has to take the first step toward peace, and Mercer figures it might as well be him. Talaya highly doubts that this plan will work, she lets Mercer know but he doesn't change his mind. This happens right around when Malloy is preparing for the command test, so he's perplexed by Mercer's decision. He can't understand why Mercer would take that risk, it could lead to him getting court-martialed. Grayson explains that this is what command is like, and Mercer's future in the Union fleet depends on if the Admiral to see value in his decision. He's taking that risk to potentially pacify their arch nemesis, so maybe it'll be worth it, but only time will tell. In episode 5, the Orville makes first contact with Rhaegar 2, and the crew is very excited because this is what they dream of. What they don't know is, that planet is governed by astrology, and when Boris and Grayson get arrested for revealing their birth dates, they learn that Gilliacs like Boris and Grayson are regarded as violent people, and they're kept in prison camps. Rigorians even try to prevent Gilliac births by performing C-sections so that babies are born earlier than the month of Gilliac. The Orville's new chief of security, Tala Kiali, discovers the reason behind this ancient tradition. Apparently a star in the Gilead constellation died and disappeared more than 3000 years ago, and the Rigorians have seen that as a bad omen ever since. Lamara and Malloy use a bunch of solar sails to reflect the dead Gilead star to Rhaegor II, and Rigorians think that the star is actually back. The Orville crew knows that that's not a permanent solution, but they're hoping that by the time the Rigorians uncover the jig, they won't even care because decades will have passed, and they will have moved on from this Gilead obsession. If it wasn't for this plan, Grayson and Bordas would have been executed following their failed prison escape attempt, but luckily seeing the star on the sky changes the locals' minds. Bordas was against sharing his birthday party with Grayson at the start of this episode, but after suffering together in the camp, they agreed to have a joint party and everyone's happy. Except maybe Mercer, who we can see laugh on the outside, but we know he's crying on the inside for having to watch Grayson having fun with Cassius.
The sixth episode of the season gives us this marvelous scene as Dr. Finn and Isaac enter into a relationship. Isaac's been a big help when it comes to Finn's kids. He protected them in season 1 when they crash landed on a moon. He proved in the season 2 premiere that Marcus wasn't the mastermind of his mischievous friend group. And he's also been giving Ty piano lessons. After seeing this different side of Isaac, Finn develops feelings for him. She asks him out and he accepts. However, at first he's only doing this to study romantic relationships and just after he wows Finn by appearing as a human in the simulation and they get it on, he intentionally starts acting like a jerk to make Finn want to break up with him. The doc puts two and two together and she is heartbroken as their relationship ends. Back on duty, Isaac makes a mistake for the first time, leading him to examine himself and he discovers that his subroutines have become so accustomed to Finn's presence that he malfunctions without her. And Mercer figures this is how the Kalon fall in love. Isaac apologizes to Finn by putting on a show on the bridge, explaining that he is incomplete without her. They end up in the simulation room once again to do the deed after they patch things up. Oh, and Boris sports a mustache after listening to Malloy's advice, and nobody but Malloy thinks it looks good, so Boris ends up shaving it off. USS Orville returns to Malkus in the middle of season 2 to have their deflectors upgraded, that is their shield, and Malkins are the ones conducting the upgrade because Malkus is one of the biggest weapon manufacturers in the Union, and the engineer responsible for supervising the upgrade is a man named Lokar, who is apparently Boris's former boyfriend. Lokar isn't like most other Malklans though, as he's interested in females, which is a crime in Malklas. The fact that he and Kiala get close is dangerous for that very reason, and when Clyden finds out about Lokar's leanings, he decides to report Lokar to the authorities. That leads Lokar to stage his own murder and frame Clyden for it, but Kiali uncovers this plot and tells Lokar that she can't allow Clyden to go to prison for a murder he didn't commit. Lokar can get asylum from the Union, but he refuses to do so. Instead, he returns to Malkus and stops hiding who he is, which ends up earning him a life in prison sentence, just because he's interested in females. Even though Kiali is furious with Clyden and disagrees with him wholeheartedly on the matter, she is still fair and doesn't go along with Lokar's scheme. And looking at the big picture, this is the umpteenth time that the Union had to tolerate Malkin traditions to avoid conflict. The Orville itself has encountered a few of those situations, so Mercer and Grayson are not sure how long this alliance can last. Talking of Grayson, she ends her relationship with Cassius, and he ends up requesting a transfer to another ship. Next up, we have a two-parter that starts with Isaac being deactivated by his fellow Kalons because he has completed his objective of gathering information on the Union. The crew has to go to Isaac's home planet Kalon 1 to discover that fact, and Finn manages to convince the Kalon to reactivate Isaac. That doesn't mean Isaac can continue working on the Orville though. He will stay on his home planet after attending a farewell party on the ship. Finn is surprised that Isaac doesn't even want to say goodbye to the kids after all they've been through together and she gets him to spend at least a few minutes with them. Kai gives him a drawing of the family with Isaac present, but Isaac just drops it as he walks away. Ty is heartbroken which is why he sneaks out of the ship to find Isaac and as he tries to hide from a bunch of Kalons, he discovers a cave with a truly insane amount of bodies. When the crew finds Ty and they look into this, Grayson uncovers that the planet is full of sites like this. Add to this the large-scale weapons the crew locates on the planet's surface and Mercer thinks it's time to confront Kalon Primary, the planet's leader. Isaac is there as well and he gives us some background information on the planet's history. The biological life form that used to inhabit this planet built the Kalons and kept them in figurative chains after they grew sentient. The ensuing Kalon revolt resulted in billions of deaths as the Kalon genocide wiped out that species. Since then, the Kalons haven't changed their opinion on biological life forms, and Isaac's findings during his time on the Orville hasn't done anything to change their opinion either. So it's funny to think that Mercer came here to convince the Kalon to join the Union, but the Kalon plan is to wipe out the Union. Mercer and company learn this when the Kalon proclaim that coexistence is impossible, and they launch an attack on the Orville before they can take off. Kalon Primary sits on the captain's chair and the Kalon fleet accompanies the Orville as they head toward Earth to launch their attack. 
It's definitely easy to hate the Kalam, but almost their entire existence has shown them that they can't reason with biological life forms. Their mindset leads them to think that their survival depends on the elimination of biological beings, and I guess they do have logical motivations from their perspective. The crew is locked up in the shuttle bay of the Orville, but Yafit's gelatinous body allows them to escape. Yafit brings a weapon to Boris, who takes down two guards. Malloy and Grayson take a shuttle to recruit the Krill, because the Kaelan are gonna kill them too, while Ty and Yafit manage to traverse the ship's vents to send a warning to Earth. However, the Kaelans find this duo, and Kaelan primary orders Isaac to kill Ty to prove his loyalty. This is when we find out that Isaac genuinely loves the Finn family and the Orville crew, because instead of shooting Ty, he kills Kalon Primary, and goes on to use an electromagnetic pulse to disable and possibly kill every single Kalon aboard the Orville, including himself. Before going through with that, Isaac tells Ty to apologize to Dr. Finn on his behalf. So the crew is now back in control and the Orville and the rest of the Union fleet defend Earth from the Kalon forces, but our heroes are outmatched and outgunned, which is why the Krill's help is so crucial. They were attacked by the Kalon just when Grayson and Malloy were failing to convince them to help, but witnessing the Kalon threat sways the Krill's decision and they show up just in time to help the Union fend off the Kalon. This is not an outright victory for the Union. The loss of life and the economic damage this caused will be hard to recover from, but at least they have forced the Kalon to retreat. Following the battle, Yafit is able to work his magic once again, as he goes into Isaac's robot body and reactivates him. And Mercer convinces the Admiralty that Isaac is not a threat. So Isaac is without a home now, he's without his own kind, but his found family on the Orville, especially the Finns, will always be there for him. He has chosen to carve his own path to protect the people he cares about. Whatever that means and however it works in his case, that doesn't matter. What matters is he didn't succumb to the societal pressure placed on him and proved that he's a unicorn among his robotic kind, because he knows that not all biological life forms are the same, and they have the potential to get more benevolent. That said, I'm not sure he would have saved the Orville without his connection to the Finns, though that personal angle is definitely the most crucial aspect here. The Krill are ready to begin peace talks with the Union following their cooperation against the Kalons, and the Orville is meeting up with a ship named Davarokos to sign a Lakvai Pact, a preliminary agreement for both sides to conduct peace talks in good faith. However, a Krill shuttle throws a spanner in the works because Davorokos starts attacking it and the shuttle requests an emergency landing on the Orville, which grants their request. The crew learns that the shuttle was being piloted by Orin Channing, Malloy's old buddy who has been in a Krill prison camp for 20 years. The Krill claim that Orin broke ceasefire after escaping as he took down four Krill vessels, so the Krill are adamant about wanting Orin back in order to continue the peace talks. Orin isn't the only person on the shuttle, he's got his daughter Lena with him, but it turns out she's not actually his daughter. She's from a planet called Lakar B, and the blood of her species, the Envol, is highly combustible when it comes into contact with nitrogen. Oren has been using that blood to craft bombs and he plans to keep doing that to disrupt peace talks because let's just say he's not a massive fan of the Krill, the species that killed his wife. He believes that peace is a slap in the face of every victim like her wife. Malloy plays along and acts like he's helping Orin, but in reality Malloy has had a talk with Kiali, and both of them agree that Orin is up to something. They just don't exactly know what yet. They soon learn about Lena and her blood, but Malloy is already out there in space with Orin. Malloy confronts Orin and the two go at it for a while before Orin activates one of the bombs. Malloy then shoots the control panel to make it impossible for the shuttle to head toward Davarokos, meaning that this duo should probably leave the shuttle in spacesuits. Orin decides he's had enough of all of this, staying on the shuttle as it explodes, while Malloy leaves and gets picked up by the Orville. With Orin out of the way, the two sides sign the Lakvai Pact. This is a rather painful experience for Malloy because he just reunited with his good friend after 20 years, only to lose him in a futile manner. Malloy remarks that Orin died a long time ago back in that cruel prison, and Mercer is there to console him.
Episode 11 is my favorite installment of the show. It involves a time capsule from 2015 which was buried in New York. An iPhone in that capsule piques Malloy's curiosity, and after Lamar and Yafit repair the phone, Malloy hooks it up to the simulator to recreate the world of the owner of the phone, Laura. Malloy gets caught up in this fantasy and he eventually sleeps with Laura. He thinks this might be the relationship he's been looking for because Laura is perfect for him. Or so he thinks because Laura gets back together with her ex-boyfriend Greg, which leads Malloy to delete Greg from the simulation. This action has unintended consequences. It makes Laura not want to sing anymore, which was one of the primary features that made Malloy fall in love with her. So without Greg in her past, Laura is a different person from the one Malloy fell for. In the end, this experience and Grayson's advice makes Malloy realize that the woman he loves is the way she is because she ended up with Greg. Laura still managed to reach across four centuries and got Malloy to fall in love with her, so she is special, but it's not realistic for Malloy to have a relationship in this simulation. This shows us that even though two people can be perfect for each other, timing is everything. Malloy is not only four centuries off the mark, but he's also met the version of Laura that was transformed by another man, Greg, and without him, she's a different person. So that's two episodes in a row that ends in heartbreak for Malloy. He lost his old friend Orin in episode 10, and now he thinks he's found his soulmate, but she's long gone. I also have to mention Bordas and Clyden because they get addicted to smoking cigarettes after finding some in the time capsule. Apparently Malklands are susceptible to nicotine addiction, so they start chain smoking and the scenes involving them are absolutely hilarious. This episode features some of my favorite clips from the Orville. But Dr. Finn puts an end to this adventure by coming up with a treatment. We return to Maglis toward the end of the season for another weapons upgrade. The Orville also agrees to transport a Malkland couple to another ship on their way out, and we soon find out that this Malkland couple has a female child, who they secretly sneaked into the Orville. They're actually on their way to a Malkland sanctuary that houses 6,000 females. Boris uncovers the couple's secret, but he keeps this to himself until the couple departs. Mercer learns about it afterward and he has to follow up to confirm what Boris is saying. This is when the crew discovers the Malkland Sanctuary, and it turns out Havina, the novelist who testified at Boris and Clyden's tribunal earlier in the season, is the leader of this all-female settlement. Avina listens to Mercer's advice, applying to become an independent colony in the Planetary Union, and the Union Council convenes on Earth to discuss the matter at hand. Fair to say that the Mockland delegation is enraged, and they threaten to leave the Union if the request is granted, which is why a compromise is the best the Union can do. This deal doesn't grant independency to the sanctuary, but it ensures that they will be left alone. In exchange, the colonists won't be able to bring any more children from Maklis to the sanctuary. And the timing of the deal is great because it comes right when the Maklin fleet was attacking the colony. So I think it's clear that this is not a permanent solution. We'll almost certainly see the return of this conflict in Season 3, because female births are more widespread than the Mocklin hierarchy claims, and in time that knowledge is surely gonna lead to some changes. You just can't put the genie back in the bottle. Remember the quantum accelerator from the very first episode of the Orville? The one that accelerated time in a confined space? It was destroyed when the Krill took it from the Orville, as Grayson came up with a plan to demolish it so that the Krill couldn't use it. Now we learn that Isaac has used that research to concoct a new quantum device that is essentially a time travel machine. Lamar is in awe of this invention, but he can't stare at it any longer because Grayson sends him on his way to engineering for a monthly analysis task. While Grayson is standing close to the quantum device, the Orville passes through a gravitational wave which accidentally activates the quantum device and Grayson's seven-year younger self travels through time and ends up on the Orville. It takes Isaac and the crew some time to figure out what's going on because even Kalons don't exactly know how quantum tech works. They figure out that Commander Grayson was thinking about her first date with Mercer when the device was activated because Mercer just wanted to get back together once again. And that's probably why Lieutenant Grayson from seven years ago, who just had her first date with Mercer, ended up on the Orville. 
At first, the two Graysons don't get along that well, but that changes when Lieutenant Grayson's idea saves the ship from a bunch of Kalons. Prior to that, the commander wasn't fond of her younger self because Lieutenant Grayson made friends with everybody, which Commander Grayson believed undermined her authority as the XO of this ship. The crew weren't supposed to get intimate with their XO. Talking of getting intimate, this is like a dream come true for Mercer, because this new Grayson has just had her first date with him. She doesn't have all the emotional baggage Commander Grayson has. So the LT and Mercer flirt for a while, but Mercer realizes this is a mistake because the history he has with Commander Grayson is impossible to replace. He loves the current Commander Grayson. Isaac and Lamar eventually figure out how to send Lieutenant Grayson back to her timeline without altering history. She'll be back at her house at the exact moment she was last there, and they will wipe her short-term memory so that she doesn't remember this encounter and doesn't alter the course of history. But unfortunately, the memory wipe is botched, so when Grayson gets back to her apartment, she decides to break things off with Mercer, because she knows from her future self that things haven't worked out. She wants to have a different future from the commander, and that changes the course of history because the Orwell crew as we know it never comes together. From this point on, the characters I'll mention are from the alternate timeline. So, Grayson never gets Mercer the Orville command after feeling guilty for cheating on him because she never cheats on him. She breaks things off. That means Dr. Finn doesn't sign up to work on the Orville, as her motivation in the original timeline was to help a captain she thought would need her help. But Mercer doesn't become the captain, so Finn never works on the Orville. Which means that Isaac never meets Ty and Marcus. The Kalons destroy half of the galaxy and that's where we pick things up when the season finale kicks off. This is taking place approximately seven and a half years after Mercer and Grayson's first date. Malloy and Mercer have stuck together and survived by visiting different planets to search for supplies. And after a close call with the Kalon, Grayson hacks their shuttle and boards it to explain the situation. Isaac and Boris aren't there, but all the important Orville officers are. Grayson knows she's at fault and her plan is to send Dr. Finn to the past so that she can perform a successful memory wipe on Lieutenant Grayson, which would hopefully remedy the mistake she made and restore the original timeline. To that end, the crew needs to find a protein that would make the wipe work. They get that from Alara, who is an important part of the resistance. She fends off a Kalon attack long enough for the crew to escape, but they still have to shoot a Kalon to get on their shuttle, and they also have to hide inside the gravity well of a black hole to avoid getting destroyed by the Kalon. Two whole days pass on the outside of the gravity well, and the Kalon give up the manhunt, but only just a few seconds have passed for our crew inside the gravity well, and so they lose the Kalon in just a few seconds. Their next destination is Earth, as they need data on the quantum device, which is on the Orville, and the Orville is at the bottom of Mariana's trench. They find Bordas aboard the Orville, he stayed behind to ensure that all escape pods launched, that's how Lamar and Kiali were able to escape, and Bordas has been on the crashed ship for 9 months. Mercer takes the captain's seat and the Orville makes it to space, where Lamar has to hack the Kalon neural network in order to access Isaac's files. That is the only way they can know how to make the quantum device work. The thing is, this would expose their location, and activating the quantum device wouldn't leave enough energy for the ship's quantum drive, meaning that they wouldn't be able to escape. Everyone agrees that this is the only way to defeat the Kalon, so they are ready to sacrifice themselves. Dr. Finn is sent to the past, and in their final moments, having gotten close on the alternate timeline, Grayson accepts Mercer's marriage proposal, so that is how their journey ends. Dr. Finn arrives in Lieutenant Grayson's apartment just after Grayson comes back from the future, and Finn explains the situation to tell her that the memory wipe didn't work. Grayson lets Finn wipe her memory for real this time, and Finn's disappearance signifies the fact that the original timeline is restored. We get another confirmation of that when Grayson agrees to go on a second date with Mercer, and the second season of The Orville concludes as everything is back to normal. Thank you for watching this recap. If you haven't seen it already, I've also got a season 1 recap on the channel. 
I'm also covering every single episode of season 3, so be sure to subscribe to catch those videos as soon as they're out. Leave your comments about season 2 down below, like the video if you've enjoyed this breakdown, and that's it for now. Take care and see you in the next video.